Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we have with us Nandita Haksar, who has been involved as a journalist, as a historian, as a law practitioner of law, involved with both the Naga issue, with the Afzal Guru case, and also with Kashmir in the larger sense, and incidentally a student of JNU once upon a time. Nandita, good to have you with us. Nandita, how do you see the nationalism versus JNU debate that has been played up? Do you see that the kind of accusations that are being hurled at JNU, and it's not just about the students and a few students raising a few slogans, it's really against the entire JNU. How do you place this debate regarding JNU and nationalism uh, today? Well, you know, they have posed it as if it's nationalism versus anti-nationalism. But the conflict really is between different kinds of Indian nationalism. And JNU is at the heart of the debate in many, many ways. I was uh, lucky enough because uh, my father knew the first vice chancellor, uh, G. Parthasarthi. And uh, I remember the debates on, or the discussions on what kind of university JNU was going to be. And it was going to be, and it was the first multidisciplinary university in India. It was transdisciplinary as well. And it was a very exciting idea in which uh, a student could take up history and plus take certain courses from the Hindi department, say medieval India, and mix the two. So it was a very exciting uh, vision of uh, higher education, higher university. And it was a vision which um, actually saw India as an extremely, dem as an inclusive democratic space. And it got its reputation uh, by its intellectual uh, vibrancy and the contribution made uh, by the university in building up a academics, and I'm speaking from the social sciences, that they are, that uh, anywhere in, in the world we stood out. And I don't really think, incidentally, I'm from JNU, I feel very strongly that I am a product. Whatever I am today, I could never have been it unless I had been in JNU, and especially for the Center of Historical Studies. So, so when you talk about various kinds of nationalism, can you talk a little more about it? What does it really mean, and how did it, you know, how did, how was it shaped in the JNU discourse? Well, a little uh, before that, as a lawyer, I would say that when I read the Constituent Assembly debates, now suddenly this uh, country, although it's an ancient land, we must remember that this is a very new nation state. So I think in the BJP discourse, they forget the difference between having an ancient land or a history or, or mythology and the, the reality, the political reality of a very new nation state. And when we became independent, there were very strong Tamil nationalism, for instance. There was Bengali nationalism. Uh, there was Naga nationalism already in the, in, in, in the beginning. And, and Kashmiri nationalism with Sheikh Abdullah. So, India was evolving and making out of all this into a one nation state. And various factors did influence that we were one nation state. We didn't recognize it as a multinational state. But at the time and till today, for instance, Sardar Patel, it is his achievement that from 552 different princely states and units, he reduced it to 15. So in a sense, it is a great administrative achievement. But they did violence to the various kinds of nationalism and linguistic nationalism, cultural nationalism in, within India. So today from 15, we have 29 states. So Part of it is the growth of linguistic states and so absolutely. on, which came out in the 50s so and even for later. And till today, if we see the debates. And in JNU, when I, as a student when I joined, I found that I met people from all over. So first time, I mean, the one example that I have right in 70, I joined it just at the end of national emergency. And at the end of the emergency, lots of people were in, still in jail. Um, and they were from across the political spectrum. They were RSS people. There was you in jail. There was socialist uh, Vijay Pratap in jail. Now, there were all kinds of people. And there were RSS people in jail. And I remember feeling, um, you know, first I got involved in human rights and to sign a petition for someone from RSS, which, we, which I opposed. But we felt that human rights is very important. And I signed a petition and asked others to sign for RSS people who were in jail. Incidentally, uh, Ghatate, Dr. Ghatate was my lawyer. 
Okay. During the emergency <laughs> battle on, so on my So you see, there was case. this, the nationalism actually took over our small sectarianism or large sectarian debates or political differences. And in JNU, for instance, I met Naga students. Now then, uh, when I met them, I also, like most Indians, felt that Nagas are anti-national. Then I, through discussions in JNU, uh, one of the students, Luingam Luitwe and I, we wrote a book called uh, Nagaland File. Now at that time I was condemned in review after review as an anti-nationalist because I had put forward the Naga point of view. Now today, after many decades and many things had happened, today Prime Minister Modi has signed an agreement with the NSEN. So, it was my Indian nationalism that I felt I had to reach out to the Nagas, understand their point of view and understand why, what was the basis of Naga nationalism and how we could include it within our uh, broader vision of an Indian nation. It's interesting you say that because when in the 50s, the Dravid nationalism, which is what you said is Tamil nationalism was really very strong. This is exactly the process by which it got built as it were into the Indian nation. Absolutely. So it's a very similar process of reaching out and then drawing it with the larger context that really makes the Indian nation what it is. Absolutely. And if the JNU had not provided a space, you see, uh, I remember I met uh, people from Jharkhand there and I, and at that time the Jharkhand people, the Jharkhand movement, this is before the Jharkhand state, they said it was Jharkhand nationalism and I was convinced that it is a kind of nationalism and before that Jharkhand question was always discussed as a tribal question and that somehow diminished their movement and I asked uh, uh, Dr. Panika that I want to call it Jharkhand nationalism. He didn't agree with it, uh, my professor, but he said, no, you have a right and you write it and argue it and if, if there's an argument for it. So there was this space and I think that space allowed a lot of people to understand their country much more in depth and it was, it, it is that which really made JNU something so special because we got students from all over India and now, you see, what we see today, there are attacks in various universities that are taking place, not only JNU. JNU is the most, uh, shall we say, blatant example of it, but we have seen attacks that have taken place in Fine Arts uh, Department in Baroda. We have seen attacks that have taken place in different places, Allahabad University, for instance. So different places, different professors who are speaking on a larger context of the nation like you are, and today seem to be under attack. Do you think this is really part of a much larger project to narrow what the nation uh, wants to be or should be? And it's really straight jacketing the nation. This is really what the agenda well, is to Absolutely, do. because I think right, I can say from the time I joined Delhi University, that was in 1969-70, ABVP was very strong at that point in ABVP and it was suffocating because any dissent they would put down by sheer numbers and gundaism. For instance, when Bipin Chandra, Harbans Mukhya, these historians who are still under attack would speak, they were just five in Delhi University, in, Delhi University, in the arts faculty, they would have lectures, we would fix it. There were 10 of us, 15 of us, 5 of us because they would just not allow them to speak. And then in 1977, uh, the, on a basis of a memorandum, which was an anonymous memorandum given to Prime Minister Moraji Desai, all these books by these historians were banned. And then we had a discussion. And I felt as a student of JNU then that we must have an open discussion. So five universities, we got uh, Aligarh Muslim University, Lucknow University, Jamia, Delhi University, JNU. We got together and had an open discussion. And I personally and my friends, we stopped anyone from disrupting when the uh, uh, pro-Jansang historian spoke. Because we believe that this battle can only be fought democratically. Now, I think they have lost that battle democratically. They know that the only way that the BJP or not BJP as much as the RSS can control the thought processes is by destroying the basis and the root of the democracy, which lies the intellectual root of the democracy by destroying all these uh, institutions of education and creativity and thinking and filmmaking and uh, you know, so therefore they are really systematically destroying this. Is this an attack on 
critical thinking which is what the university is supposed to nurture do you think that's Absolutely. really what the process critical is? creative thinking especially about uh, the future of democracy i mean as a student of history what is the rss view of history their golden age lies in the gupta period now without going into the debate whether it was a golden age or not i think my golden age for my country lies in the future not in the past and that's what our history department was trying to show us we don't want a india with caste prejudices with patriarchy where women are burnt alive and uh, brutally raped and the kind of violence on dalits if it is an india which is vibrant democratic then it lies in the future not in some golden age of the gupta period and they cannot win us intellectually they cannot defeat us intellectually the only way they can do it is by putting us in jail or brute force which is what you yes. see being exhibited in different universities on the roads of delhi patiala patiala house courts and also in the kind of verbal abuse which is being hurled all over the social media which yes. is the other space which is sort of being taken over by the goonish behavior of the bjp uh, acolytes no absolutely i mean look at the person they put kanaiya kanaiya whose father is a ordinary wage laborer mother is anganwadi worker they used to say jnu's elitist where is the elitism here are dalit students who have with great difficulty they are the first generation first uh, people who have become educated you put them out a whole community suffers same with rohit vimula in the case of Absolutely. hyderabad central university he was again uh, mother who strought fought hard to bring up the children gave them education and this is it was under abbp's pressure and backed by the education minister and the labor minister that they were finally penalized and uh, thrown out of the university virtually yes and and the scholarship stops and then there's curb on scholarships for dalits so if they do this then who do they want to rule it will be the brahmans upper caste people uh, narrow minded people who will rule india no indians will accept it they can't win this game last question nandita kashmir issue now of obviously there is a enormous amount of frustration in kashmir with respect to the indian state the kind of uh, shall we say violations that have occurred on civil liberties earlier elections and so on do you think that the way to you know deal with this is by saying all this is anti national throwing out students from for instance from aligarh because it's in a cricket match they supported pakistan what do you think it portrays for kashmir no i think well as a person who took up afzal's case and as afzal's lawyer and who has written books about it published afzal's letters i think that what i was doing and my slogan was at that time and still is that defending gilani mr s a r gilani was defending indian democracy if we showed that our country had fair trial procedures if we showed that we had democracy that our police was not corrupt and i think that work and the trial because gilani was acquitted actually it won over hundreds and hundreds of kashmiris they've come to me they said we never thought we'd buy your book because your father was pn haksa he was responsible for bangladesh but now we will and i was invited to speak in kashmir and write for kashmiri papers and in the same way as i had hoped that i could one win friends nagas for india the it was with the same spirit that i and all those i think who supported the gilani and the afzal campaign did now by doing this they've closed the space and they've closed the space and the kashmiris are again angry but their slogans are what thank you jnu thank you because they felt someone in the mainstream india was still remembering them and so who is the anti national who those who win friends for india and indians or those who make enemies thank you nandita i think we'll close on that note who are the real friends of india and who are its real enemies this is what we need to look at when you look at the so called anti national versus national debate which is going on over jdu thank you very much this is all the time we have for news click today please keep watching news click